Okay, so this is lecture 19 of ECE 2305, and so today we enter the world of the network layer. We're also going to talk about the internet protocol, and in particular, the structure behind IP addressing. Okay, so before I go into the network layer, let's, let's recap our, internet, our protocol architecture that we saw in the third lecture of this course. Okay, so here, let's recap protocol architecture. So this is the generic one, generic. So what we had, we have a cloud, and it's, it's our computer network, or communications network, communications network. And we can arrange, let's say, a computing device. Let's call these computers, OK? Computer A. Computer B, computer C, okay? And then those computers are connected to this communications network, and we know that in general they are consisting of a variety of different layers, each one handling data in a different way. They generate it and then they receive it. So we have the network uh, what is it called? Access layer. We have the transport layer. And we have the application layer. Okay? So A L T L N A L. And those little parentheses, those are our ports, right? To the application layer. And the network access layer is the final step between the computer and the communication network. So that's where we actually get the physical connection between the computer itself and the communication network. So what we're looking at, what happens is, let's say we zoom in on the network access layer. Okay, Zoom in. So what we've looked at so far, we can subdivide this network access layer, and that's our transport layer above, okay? We can divide it into several sub-layers, right? Like, you know, we have a physical layer, and that could be the radio technology. We have a Mac and link layer and all that. And then the final one is the actual network layer. And what the network layer does, among other things, is it prepares the information to go from the network access layer to the transport layer, and vice versa. If there's any information that we're receiving from the transport layer, the transport layer packages it, the network layer receives it, and then prepares it for being communicated over the air. So what's interesting is that each one of these layers, their purpose is like starting with, let's say, the application layer, where we have a physical application that interacts with the human operator. It could be any operation, right? Could be email, could be a web service, could be VoIP, voice over IP. That application that interacts with us, it generates data, it gets packaged, it then goes through a port. It goes into the transport layer. It gets packaged. It goes into the network access layer. It gets packaged. It gets sent over to communications layer. And then the reverse is done at their intended receiver, right? So what we're going to be looking at is that final layer of packaging or unpackaging between transport layer and the rest of the network access layer. I'll keep this for now. Specifically, okay, so we have transport segments, and they are sending and receiving to a host. And so what, what happens is when we send them, we encapsulate them into datagrams, the IP datagrams. And then when we're receiving, we deliver those segments to, those tra to the transport layer above us, right? And so what happens is, in particular, the network layer 
with all these IP datagrams, it has two basic functions, routing and forwarding, right? So forwarding, what it does is, if we go back to this, so this was a rather basic protocol architecture. We do have situations within the cloud of routers and servers and other intermediate devices between point A and point B. And what, what ends up happening is that it will say, oh, what IP address? Oh, no, you want to go to the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy. So what happens is part of the purpose of the network layer is to say, oh, you got this IP address? Oh, according to my table, that's the next server over. That will get you a little bit closer where you want to go, right? So the first part is being able to enable the movement of data from point A to point B. The other feature, the other function, is actual routing. And so what I mean by routing? What's the difference between routing and forwarding? So forwarding is the action of moving the data. Routing is how do you formulate the end-to-end -end path. So you might think this is not a big deal, right? But actually, it is. So let me give you an example. So now I'm going to delete it. Bye-bye, diagram. Boo. So, what, so for instance, suppose you have this guy, that guy. So that's point A, point B. Here's the cloud diagram, right? And this is your internet. Okay? So what's, what's interesting about it? So if I needed to route, how would I route it? What would be my criterion for routing? Perhaps shortest path. Right? Shortest path, fewest intermediate steps. And the other kind of important thing that people don't think about, least congestion uh, en route. And what do I mean by that last one? So, so let's say we take this example. So what would I like to do? How would I like to route this? So let's say this is a wired network. So first, it might go here. Let's say the data from A to B. Then it might go here, 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 right? That's an awful lot of hops, right? What happens is, why am I so worried about this step by step by step by step by step? Because each one of these guys, one factor that we're worried about, especially for things like voice over IP or real-time communications, comms, is latency. Ah, I wish I can spell latency. So this is critical. Like if any of you use Skype, so like you know, earlier this week I talked with a friend of mine in New Zealand. And you know, it's a little bit interesting because you talk with him and then you're like, one potato, two potato, three potato, and then he gets a response. Because otherwise it's like, so what do you think, Pavel? And then you wait. Oh, I think it should be this. Then I wait for my response. So you have to kind of throttle yourself. Because if you say, what do you think, Pavel? Hey, Pavel. And then he begins giving his answer, and then it's that awkwardness, right, that we all experience. That, that might be fun, but let's say real-time comms. Like, for instance, uh, telemedicine. So suppose you're doing a surgery, like that's the scary thing, right? And you have this robotic arm, right? And you say, why is it not going deep enough? And then you're really pushing it. And then, no, 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 no. And then the scalpel and bad things happen. So what happens is latency can be like threatening, right? So what happens is shortest path, because each one of these guys gives you a non-zero penalty. It processes, it routes your data, but it does so at a cost of time. <laughs> Few steps, so fewer of these in the way, the better it is, but at the same time, you also run the risk. Wherever most of your data, like, you know, in the network is going through, that's going to be a bottleneck. You might not get access right away, right? There are, there is one network that's kind of interesting that uh, attempts to sort of prevent this, um, which is called like uh, Internet 2, right? So we have the internet and you know everyone's on YouTube and such. 
There's also something called Internet 2, which um, the way it's set up, so it uses the Internet, and it's by a few, it's a consortium. It has like a few universities, a few companies. What they do is they set up paths across the Internet that are reserved for specific applications. You're guaranteed that bandwidth. There's not much else traveling on that, so you actually get pretty decent rates. But it's for very specific applications. You've got to use it for whatever. Like, you know, there's a number of conditions. So it's not for everyday Alex or Jen or whatever. Like, I go home, I'm going to use the Internet too today. No, no, it's specific for applications such as, um, you know, if you do, for instance, um, one application, I remember many years ago when I was a PhD student, music technology. If you have some orchestra, and it's, let's say it's a, a virtual orchestra between several mini orchestras around the world, you can use Internet 2 to connect everybody with extremely low latency because you've got the paths reserved, and you're not doing too many hops, and everything's set up for that. So what happens is this routing is very tricky because you want to minimize latency, right? And you want to guarantee bandwidth. All right. Okay. So, one thing to remember in a network, especially, is that there is no guarantee of timely delivery. There is no guarantee for eventual packet delivery. There is no in order um, delivery guarantee. In essence, what happens is the internet, the, the, this, 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 net, this network layer and, and the network that's connected to with all these IP addresses and stuff, we call it best effort, right? Like, oh, we'll try and get this to you, right? So it's not like UPS or FedEx and such, where it's like, we'll get this to you by the next day and such. No, 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 no. There are no guarantees. And what happens is, really, what happens is all these packets of information they fly around in the internet. And remember, we saw this with uh, a couple of lectures ago about frame sequence, right? The sequence numbering, how we stitch things together, and the possibility of dropping a frame, dropping a frame, dropping a frame. This is exactly the situation. You send this information across, and then at some point, maybe some of the information's dropped. Maybe some of the information doesn't make it all the way across in a timely manner. Let's say packet, let, let's say packet four doesn't come until 10 seconds later. It makes it there, but that's too late. I've already formed my message less packet four, right? So the internet and this IP protocol and such does not guarantee anything, right? It'll do its best, but it will not make promises that you will form a message 100% with everything that you send at the other end. It's just going to get jumbled up, and you hope that everything will be stitched together at the other end. Okay. And so what happens is there's this thing called connection and connectionless services. So the datagrams in the network, in the network layer that we send out, okay, what happens is this implies a connectionless type of service. Like what I mentioned, we fire these things out, they get routed. Some of them might go to a different part of the world before it makes it to join the rest of that data in order to form the information that you initially sent out, right? There's no concept that you have a dedicated connection, unlike the virtual circuit, right? The virtual circuit network where it says they will all go down this path, this information. Okay. So what happens is we don't have, okay, in a datagram network, we don't have any pre-established pathway. What happens is data is generated as source. It gets sent out over the network. That cloud diagram that I have before, uh, where is it? This guy here, right? So data is generated here, but it could go this way. It can go this way. Maybe this guy took a much longer route. Oh, and by the way, this server is dead. OK, I have to go back. Go this way. Oh, I want to go to Paris. Now I go here. Now I go there. Oh, finally, I reached that guy. And what happens is they, this information might be delayed. Some bits of this information might, get, might take longer to get to point B than others, right? So at the end of the day, at B, those datagrams, right? Whenever I hear datagrams, I think of Teddy Grams. I'm not sure how many of you like Teddy Grams. Ah, woo! 
serial goodness. Actually, one of my PhD students for his prototype system, so he was looking at near-field communications, and I told him not to do this. He put his prototype, I think it's like a Raspberry Pi, and several other cards wired together on a Teddy Graham box, and he took a photograph of it and put it in his PhD dissertation. I said, Steve, why Teddy Graham box? And he says, this is my dissertation. And I said, okay, fine. Your name is on it. You know. So anyways, I digress. Many, so many things with Teddy Grahams. Okay, so datagrams. So what ends up happening is that these guys might come on the order of like, you know, this guy might, might have taken 10 milliseconds to get here. This one might have taken 11 milliseconds. Some might have some gross latency. It might have taken longer because this poor guy here may have taken the longer scenic route, if you will, through the network to get to point B, right? So the way the, the uh, network layer works is essentially this data gets from point A to point B. There's no guarantee, right? So, and part of that is the robustness, right? So you try and stitch everything as best you can. If you lost information, sure as heck, you better have redundancy in, in, in the system so it does not bring down, like, you know, it doesn't corrupt all your message and you have to retransmit, okay? I'll keep that. That looks like a cool diagram. So what happens is, so, and all of this is accomplished using forwarding tables. So remember, we talked about this before with switches. Remember switches about seven lectures ago? So switches, we had, okay, you have this IP address. Oh, you want to take this, uh, this um, connection on this Ethernet cable down to that guy, right? It was like uh, through Ethernet. Here, the forwarding table is essentially you have an IP table. You have all these IP addresses. And it says, oh, you're at this IP address? You want to go to that server. And you go through that server. That server says, oh, you have this IP address you want to go to? You want to go this way. So it's like passing the IP, you know, the datagram onto the next server or router uh, onto its final destination. So what's kind of interesting, when we deal with datagrams, Sometimes they're a little large, right? Sometimes these datagrams and the links that are, that are supporting them have something called a max transfer size. Sometimes they're a little too big. So what we would do is we will fragment it intentionally. Usually, as you know, we're all engineers, right? We all probably dealt with computers at some point in our lives. And you, we hear about defragmentation, right? Our hard disk is fragmented. Sounds like a bad thing. In this case, fragmentation is a good thing. Because if the link does not support it, well, then we have to find a link that does support that very large datagram. What we do here is our datagram gets carved up into multiple pieces, right? And then it's sent down these links with these MTUs that now can support them. They get received. And then the da these fragmented datagrams are reassembled. Oh, that sounds cool. It's almost like, you know, a kit car or something. They're reassembled at the final destination. So that's kind of interesting. I know, everything's kind of interesting. But this is really interesting. So suppose this guy here. Nope. So this guy here. Suppose that he only got to point B because we took him. And we had to fragment him, fragment, into little mini datagrams, right? And then we send all of those across the network. And those, in turn, go all through that big cloud diagram we call a communications network. And then at the receiver, stitch them, reassemble them together, right? To form that guy at the end in 10 milliseconds time. Wow. So that's, th that's what's meant by fragmentation, OK? So as for addressing, so I mentioned addressing, addressing. How do we know? How do we forward information from one server to another? And I think we've all seen this, right? We've all seen this. And whenever we set up our computers, whenever we look at you know, um, the network setup on Windows, Mac, our phones, Linux, you name it. So what happens is the IP address is a 32-bit identifier for host and the router interface. Um, tomorrow's lecture, so lecture 20, 
we'll talk about I, IPv6. And why is IVP6 so important? So what is IVP6? Essentially, it's a much, much, much bigger IP address. It has many more combinations, because you can imagine, each one of these guys, this entry, this entry, this entry, and this entry, range in value, right? So, so up to 255, each one of these, right? So what are all the possible combinations of IP addresses in the entire world, uh, excluding those internal addresses and such? Well, you know, if you, if you take each one of them, you d perform the combinatorics, probably a very big number. But that is being challenged. That is being challenged by something called Internet of Things, or IoT. So Internet of Things means that everything, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your car stereo, uh, probably your running shoes at some point, has an IP address. This is a problem. Because if we have, just in this room alone, like millions of IP-based type of devices, we're in big trouble. We're going to use up that entire set of unique IP addresses super duper quickly. So as we'll talk about in lecture 20, there's something called IV IPv6 that will provide us with an even bigger swath of IP addresses that will at least temporarily stave off the um, revolution of Internet of Things. Going back to this, so what do we call this? We call these IPv4, okay, version 4 as opposed to version 6. So what happens is we have this address, it's a 32-bit number. The interface we have between, let's say, a host or a router and a physical link, um, and usually router has multiple, just like if at home. If you have a router, you have multiple uh, connections to the outside world. A host usually has one or two and that we have an IP address associated with each connection, each interface. And we talked about MAC addresses, right? But they're flat. So we're going to be looking at IP addresses and how they can be hierarchical. Ooh, hi, hierarchical. Okay. Canadian English. Mm -mm. So what happens is these 32-bit addresses, we can divide them into classes, okay? So there are three. So there's class A, B, and C. So class A means we have very few networks, but lots of devices connected to them. So for instance, like WPI, right? We have a very, we, in this case, we have the one network, or maybe we have a few um, subnets, as we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But we have a gajillion devices. Imagine, we're a polytechnic. Every year, at least one of these computer labs, we get brand new computers, right? And a new set of IP addresses and the like. Class B is kind of the middle ground, a medium number of networks and a medium number of devices in each network. And then finally, Class C, lots of networks with very few devices connected to each. But what happens is um, this sort of um, technique, class-based routing, is not very efficient, right? So imagine you reach this network, and it's like, I have all these devices that I can access, like, you know, forward information to or get information from. And in particular, class A might be problematic because we might not be able to subdivide those ranges, right? So what ends up happening, there's something called classless, that sounds not nice, classless interdomain routing, or CIDR. And what CIDR does is you can specify the length of your network part. So what you can do is you would have a format like this. Say, like, here's your first, um, uh, your, your, you know, your IP address, your 32-bit IP address, slash X, and X is the number of bits in the network portion of your address. So let's say we have slash 23. What this means is that, you know, we, we have, in this case, the number of bits in the network portion of my address is going to be 23, right? And so what we would do, it would mean that we would have, let's say, these guys, these three digits from 223.16 would form the network address, and then the last guy would be our host address. Okay? So this is sort of like the, the, the shorthand of saying, hey, that last, last number in your IP address represents the, uh, the network, uh, you know, the host address. Then there's subnets. I brought this up before. So whenever you set up 
your network on your laptop. Sometimes there's something called a subnet mask. Most people use the default, right? 255, 255, 255, 0. What is a subnet? And a subnet is essentially, it's, uh, what it does is it's a portion of the, um, like, you know, you take these, uh, the, the host portion of the address, and you create smaller networks from them. So what happens is it's a portion of the IP address, and that's formed by the higher order bits. You then take the host portion of the IP address. Those are the lower bits. And what you do is you kind of you set this up in such a way that you know, what happens is you don't have an intervening router. You kind of keep them separated. You don't have a physical router in, involved in creating these little sub-networks within your overall network. Okay? So what you're essentially doing is you're creating an island, if you will, of devices inside each network. So I'm going to carve out these devices in my overall network. I'm going to give it this subnet address. So they're kind of like, OK, this is a subnetwork within this overall network. They, they will be connected to the rest of the network, but I don't need an actual router, which is cool. Okay. Last but not least, so if you ever want to get an IP address uh, what's the name of that service again? The one, like you go online and, and you pay 10 bucks a year and you get your own. Uh... Yep. Oh, well, that's one of them. But even, even like some of the more like, I wouldn't say sketchier ones, but uh, like, but, but, but which one? Yeah, well, no, not the free, no, like, you know, you say, I want this Ethernet address and this IP. So that's one. Like, you know, there's a variety of services out there that, like you say, pen, pay 10 bucks a year or whatever service charge, and you can get an IP address, you can get a, 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 a name or whatever, um, or hosting and stuff. But really, what it all comes down to is this guy here, the Internet Corporation for the Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN. What happens is uh, you can visit them online, but these are the only guys in the world responsible for the allocation of IP addresses, all right? So these guys, okay, um, they're, so they're an international organization. The dot org signifies that they're also nonprofit theoretically. And what happens is these are the guys that say, I want an IP address. I want a static IP address. You would talk with them. They manage all the DNS tables out there. They also assign domain names and resolve any sort of disputes, you know? So what happens is these guys um, are really like, you know, the buck stops there with respect to um, if you want to get an IP address or a domain name. They, they are, so you can go through these other, GoDaddy, that's the name, yeah. So, like, uh, you know, there, so all these services that, that you hear about, they really, all they are is sort of a front end to these guys over here. I'm not sure where they're based. I bet you it's Switzerland, but I might be wrong. Okay, so what did we cover in today's lecture? We talked about, first of all, revisiting the protocol architecture that we know and love that we saw in the second and third lecture. We also saw how the network layer fit in that architecture, the interface between the network access layer and the transport layer. We then saw the structure of an IP address. We saw the concept of classes and also class uh, CIDRs, and as well as where you can get an IP address for your own self. Okay, so with that, that concludes lecture 19. Okay. So those folks...